Good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Shares, where we add value to people's lives happening every Wednesday and Thursday on ebizradio.com. You can catch the Lunchtime Series on all major podcast channels today. As a proponent and advocate for climate change, if you want to help climate change and find out more about what you can do about it, Clean Creatives is calling all agencies, PR companies, and individuals to stop working with fossil fuel industry and brands to stop working with the agencies that continue to do so. Sign the pledge at cleancreatives.org forward slash South Africa. Clean Creatives, the future of creativity is clean. Guys, go and check it out. It's a really good cause and uh, it's a wonderful way of actually actively getting involved with climate change. On today's coaching segment, we have the director and co of our Rain Tree back with us. Uh, and uh, welcome back, Fiona Kutsia. Thank you for our monthly, our monthly guest joining us. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Kevin. Great to be back. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, you know, falling straight into, into conversation today, and one of the things that I know that something you've personally been through, something that you've actually had to, had to really recover from, uh, is the big, the big old, uh, you know, I want to say it's the big baddie, and because it is a big baddie, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the, the very important subject of burnout, so, you know, I, I want to. I just want to read to start it off with what the the World Health Organization says about this, and then I just want you to sort of share a bit of, you know, tell tell us a bit about your story and how this really affected just about everything and what was happening and and and. But I mean, the World Health Organization says burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress. That, not, uh, that has not been successfully managed. It is characterized by three dimensions. And those three are feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feeling a negativism or cynicism related to your job and reduced professional efficacy, right? So don't you want to just kick it off with us and share with us, you know, from real life experience, how this came about for you and, you know, how it showed up for, uh, for you in your life. Yeah, Kevin, this is something that has actually been um, for many years that I've been grappling with. And I didn't realize it at the time. It was only quite recently when burnout became this, you know, this, this trend word. And, and um, we openly started speaking about burnout that I was able to really eyeball it. But it comes from back in the day working in an agency environment, high stress. It's like they say in that excessive stress work environment. Um, what I didn't realize at the time was I thought it was the company, the managers, the clients that caused all of this for me. What was fascinating when years later I left the industry and I became a coach it took me exactly two years to work myself right back into burnout and then I had no one to blame. Yeah. So, you know, that was a big wake up call for me. And the other one was, you know, when we start getting negative feelings around our work, that for me was a massive wake up call when I realized I'm, I'm doing my passion work. I'm doing what I've always wanted to be doing. How can I feeling, be feeling negative about it? Um, and that's when I was able to step into action. What I find fascinating is how it's been currently just become such a current subject and it's become so real in so many people's lives and I wanted to kind of understand why suddenly now what is different um, I know why I grappled with it for so many years but why are so many people currently struggling um, and when you really look at what we have gone through over the last two years in this excessive stressful environment where we were in constant fear and stress around our work. Am I going to keep my work? How do I survive on 50% salaries or less? My industry is busy sinking. What am I going to do? How do I take care of my loved ones? What happens if I contract COVID or one of my family members contra contract COVID? What if we don't survive? And because there was so much anxiety around work and job, what we also started doing then as employees is we started breaking our personal boundaries. We started working from home and now suddenly work-life integration happened, but we let go of our personal boundaries. So they were increased working hours, um, 
our personal boundaries were shattered. We were constantly worrying um, and in stress. And all of that excessive stress on our, on our bodies is taking its toll. And I believe that's why we're currently hearing so much around people being in burnout. And one of the things that also that also stand out quite significantly is it's it's almost sounds like and I know this is a bit of a, a dichotomy in itself is people are using burnout as a, it's almost a cool label to have. Mm -hmm. Like oh, it's I'm going through, like I'm going through burnout. You won't know, but you won't believe how how very busy I am, and and the busyness of my burnout, and the burnout of my busyness, and I'm so, you know, I'm I'm such a good great employee because you know I I struggle, but I suffer through this, and I'm kind of going, why 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 are we doing this? Like why are we labeling it like as this cool thing to be suffering through? Mm -hmm. Right, that's not cool. It's not a yeah, it's become, it becomes sexy to be tired. It becomes sexy to be busy. It's become sexy to be in burnout. And the um, very thing, the very thing that we, we as coaches, you know, are, are proponents of and and really want people to recognize is um, that isn't sexy. What's no. sexy is when you've got a grip on things, when you're managing your time, when you're building boundaries you know, that kind of stuff, that is very sexy. When someone's got a handle on that, to me, you know, that, yeah. uh, but not only sexy, but it's it's vitally important to your own health that, you know, that becomes a very important part of your life. That's, that's sexy. And that's also what true success looks like, right? Yeah. We think being, creating this busyness, um, it makes us feel important and makes us feel successful. Yeah. Not realizing that we're actually very ineffective, and that is unsexy. It's not. It's not successful at all. I, uh, that, that's such an important point. That the sexiness of our burnout is actually ineffective. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just so you hear that, guys. The sexiness of your burnout is actually ineffective. You're actually being ineffective because you're not coping. You're stressed. You're making really bad decisions and you don't even realize, you know, it's that whole thing. I'm like, I don't know what I don't know until I know I know kind of situation <laughs> that I don't even know I have a problem because it's become an identity. And I'd so identify with the drama and the depression and the sadness and the uh, all that comes with burnout. You know, there's this anxiety. There's so much that that so many attributes that that fuel this. Right? And, and if I may interrupt you, it was such yeah. a gut punch realization for me. It was like, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> yeah, like, oh my, this is me. And you like sort of realize this is me and this is what I'm doing. This is what yeah. I'm doing to myself, right? Yeah. So one of the things I want to share uh, around this and which I found so fascinating when it said reduce professional efficacy. Now, one of the, the social learning theorists, um, uh, Albert Bandura, he proposed by, um, he emphasizes the importance of observation, modeling, and um, limiting the behaviors and attitudes of emotional reactions of others. Um, and I did a, a lot of research on him around confidence. And the funny thing is, when you read, you know, what the World Organization speaks about, reduce professional efficacy, the thing about confidence right, is confidence is made up of two very important factors, and those are self-efficacy and self-esteem. Now, self-esteem plays directly into what I'm saying to myself, my limiting beliefs, how I'm actually speaking to me the whole time. So, you know, not only does burnout really start reducing your efficiency at doing your job, right? The fact that you're going through all of this um, really starts um, having an effect on how you speak about yourself. So I'm supposed to be really great at my job. I'm supposed to be a, an effective leader and manager and uh, an important part of, of my business, but yet I'm failing hopelessly based on the, the sexiness of my burnout, right? Invariably, right, you're failing at your job and what happens? You it's you 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 create an unspoken sort of limiting belief of self where you're going, wow, I'm not actually getting to this. I'm not actually getting to this. I'm not actually getting to this. So your own self-talk is creating its own limiting belief by the fact that you're failing yourself by having this negative cynicism about your own work. 
and you're literally inefficient at what it is you're doing. So in those rounds, you simply don't have confidence in actually showing up for your own position, which I found so fascinating when, it, you know, it's, they speak about the feeling of negativism and cynicism and how it affects your efficacy. You cannot at any point be confident in what it is you're doing if you're not met with these two areas really fueling and speaking to efficiency and how to get there in a big way, right? Uh, what do you what do you see how this fits into you know where where um, burnout where it comes to burnout, especially from being in that space? Mm. I, I think the bigger no, the biggest knock on the confidence is just simply not having the energy to. Um, and then you you kind of going into the space of I'm faking it whilst I'm making it. For me, a big wake up call was the realization that I have a responsibility as a business owner to show up. Yeah. Um, in a way, I still got away when I was in a leadership position um, in a bigger team. But as leaders and as business owners, it's the realization that we need to eyeball this thing. And we have responsibility towards our team and towards our clients and towards our business to show up and to do what needs to be done to confidently lead our businesses and our teams. Um, oh, you know, it's, it's, it really is a very heavy space to be in where you feel like you just don't have the passion and the energy to show up fully and to be the confident leader that you truly are, because there's definitely a knowing, you know that you are this person, but it's almost yeah. like half of you is a bit murky, the, the brain is feeling murky, um, and you just don't have the energy to. It's a very uncomfortable space to be in. I want to touch on, just from your reference as well, um, how does it play into self-worth? Because, you know, I'm just looking at the, at the again, at the, um, at the, uh, the, what the uh, the World Organization Health says about this. And, you know, when it speaks to really becoming cynical and really becoming negative around how you show up for yourself, uh, and yet you, you know from a business owner's perspective, from, a, you know, a colleague and so, uh, being the manager or the one with the team, um, you just don't feel like it, right? So you, you almost like... The, so then you have to ask yourself, where's that coming from? What is driving this force? What is driving this? I don't feel like it, right? And then to me, one of the questions I ask is how much does self-worth play into that negative cynicism, right? And the feelings of, of uh, degradation that you have a, around yourself and showing up for yourself because not only you're, you're failing, you're always tired, you don't want to show up, you don't want to see people. Um, in, in essence, your self-worth is being knocked for a six, right? Completely. Yeah, you know, you're making yourself this small. Can the world just not see me right now? Please forget about me in this moment. I don't have the energy to show up. Um, yeah. And because when you do are forced to show up, you're kind of faking it whilst you're making it. You can imagine what does what that does to one's self-worth. Um, so it's this constant gnawing at your self-worth and it knocks you, like you say, for a six. And because it's this ongoing thing, um, it really breaks you down over a long period of time if you don't address it. And I think, you know, what, what's also important to mention here around self-worth is because a lot of people go, well, I don't really know what that is, right? Um, and for, for us, you know, it, it comes back to the building blocks of what, why humans do what humans do, right? And you show me someone's behavior, I'll tell you what's happening in their head, right? Essentially, words, feelings, behavior essentially will support exactly what it is that's going on in your head, right? So you can actively, from a cognizant uh, place, see how you self-sabotage your own, your own moment, because that's what's happening. Your self-sabotage moment, especially working around, um, yes, I say, I, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, but your self-sabotage and your self-worth that is not supporting the thing you're doing 
really will show you long term, kind of look at it over the last three months. How am I doing? What have I been doing? How much time have I taken for myself? How much effort do I put in um, taking simple things like journaling, simple things like um, appreciation for the present moment and being mindful and being literally found in your skin, in your moment, and actually just uh, being in your moment to appreciate self and what it is you do have, right? Because all of that goes away when you are self-deprecating and you just don't feel it because you'd rather be sleeping, mm. right? Um, essentially... And the more you sleep, the worse you feel, actually, because sleep isn't the <laughs> cure. <laughs> right? Right, so... And without having to unpack all of it, because this, it's a, such a big conversation that we can touch on so, or, uh, so much of it. But, you know, from I'm going to, you know, I want to I want to leave the audience today with, you know, the, the very reason around efficacy um, needs to be supported with how you speak to yourself and how you speak to yourself is underpinned with the self-worth that you have for yourself mm -hmm. as a human. Right. And if you're noticing that those things are out of whack, you can most certainly understand and believe that your your behaviors and your actions will show up in a certain way and you'll start recognizing a pattern. And and you can honestly start speaking to, well, what is my self-worth and how am I actually doing something about that? Uh, and that's a whole extra huge conversation on its own. But just getting people to start recognizing when they are starting to go through this burnout situation, mm -hmm. how do they actively start recognizing the efficacy, the self-talk and their self-worth? Because that in itself is a beautiful indicator. And yes, I use the word beautiful because when we start paying attention to the awareness, the self-awareness of what is my world doing? What am I doing? How am I feeling? Oh, this is interesting that I'm feeling this way again. Like what happened in this moment? Why am I feeling like this again, right? Having the self-awareness of what is going through your body because then you're actively involved with uh, curbing and really paying attention to you possibly might be going through burnout. It's, it's so, uh, I love what you're saying there because that for me was the tipping point. I started noticing the dialogue um, I would have with my daughter. And I've started noticing how often I say to her, um, Mom's just tired today. And yeah. I started sharing it with my partner and I started sharing it with my business partner. And I started becoming aware of the self dialogue. And, and, be, when when it became aware, when it came into the consciousness, I was able to eyeball it and say, "But hang on, I'm tired of being tired. I need to do something." Yeah. Um. You know, I always go to the practical side of things, and I and I thought I would share some of the and there are a lots of help out there, lots of stuff to read up on. Yeah. Um. So I was just thinking quite practically, what were the things that I did that truly supported me in this journey? And it is a journey, you know. Um. I did the damage to my body for many years. It's not going to be fixed in a couple of months. Yeah. Um. It is a journey of truly changing lifestyle and changing habits. Um. That is required to start looking after yourself and, and breaking this horrible cycle. So I had to eyeball it. I had to accept that it's real and I had to make it real for myself. And it was interesting in, in my case, I had to have that confirmation from a specialist person that I trusted because I thought it's all in my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever it is that you need to do, if you're listening to this and you think, oh, you know, I might be having this, do what you need to do to realize that this is real for you. Because the second it comes into that conscious and incompetence, we're able to work with it. Yes. The second thing I did was I realized I needed help. This was years and years and years of bad habits. Um, and there was no way in hell that being as exhausted as I was in that moment, that I was going to step out of this by myself. Um, I actually went to a medical doctor first to just do some blood tests. I wanted to just check that everything um, in the body was doing what it was meant to be doing. And thank goodness it was still doing. Um, so there was just some recommendations about supplements. Um, you know, whatever that looks like for you. Um, what helped me a lot, interesting enough, was working with a dietitian um, that helped me around eating habits that enhances my energy because I realized I was also eating food. So it was actually draining me, making me feel heavy and tired. 
Mm-hmm. Um, one could reach out to a coach or to a psychologist, whatever works for you, but you don't have to go through this by yourself. Get help. Um, the next thing I realized, and I, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier on, it's charging your battery. And sleep isn't necessarily it. I realized that there, there is a section, it's kind of, you know, when I, I remember going on holiday and for the first week, all, all I wanted to do was just sleep. And then once I've finished sleeping, I was like, okay, okay, now I can start doing some stuff. Um, but when I was in burnout, just binging on Netflix and sleeping on the couch definitely wasn't charging me. I actually felt worse on, on a Monday morning. Yeah. So I needed to practically go out and this was little steps. And I need to say this because anybody who is in burnout will tell you, I don't have the energy to go do big things. If you change, ask me to do, go do massive big changes in my life, I'm just not going to do it because I'm just too tired. Micro behaviors, yeah. Absolutely that, yeah. So there is a, you know, do get enough sleep. Look at your sleeping patterns um, and see, you know, how many hours do you some people require more sleep than others how much sleep do you need to feel okay the next day what are you eating i've mentioned that i worked with a dietitian to get to better eating habits that supported actually energizing me the water intake i mean you know this well just on that point one of the things that we know about the gut brain right the gut Mm. brain uh we know creates up to 70 percent of your serotonin right there we go your feel good brain your feel good drug in your body if you're not looking after the gut, um, you instinctively won't be happy. You instinctively yeah. won't feel like getting out of bed, yeah. right? So food intake and anything to do with your gut and what will influence your gut, especially inflammation, especially if you're allergic to wheat or gluten intolerant mm. or any of that, uh, your gut's kind of not coping and actively, uh, you know, um, and it's so interesting. You have nine different points, nine different big nerves that go from your actual gut straight into your vagus nerve that travels right to the brain, yeah. right? So you, if you actively influencing your gut brain, um, you're actively sending the wrong information or energy or uh, cells to the brain constantly. So <laughs> it's just, it's a very interesting, yeah. Fascinating. You know, you often get that question, if you can go back to your youthful self and you have one sentence or three words, you know, what would you tell them? Yeah. I always look at those things and I go, I would tell my, my young self to eat right and exercise. Yeah. It is just, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, we hear this, but the real impact on us yeah. in terms of eating healthy, exercising, drinking water. And the next one is to start moving. Now, if you tell someone to burn out, start exercising, they might vomit in your face. Sorry. To yeah. It. <laughs> but it's yeah. just like I, you're getting out of bed and getting dressed feels like crossing the Grand Canyon. What do you mean I need to start exercising? So I soften that a little bit and I say, just start moving. Start yeah. moving. Yeah. whatever feels okay it's that and you will know the science behind that but you know if you tell your brain i'm just going to walk for five minutes it's so small that the brain can't argue no we're not yeah i can't go just walk for five minutes yeah anybody can go just walking for five minutes so yeah. whatever that looks like for you just start moving um and the and the, the other big one and this was really big for me was to identify activities that charges my batteries I never understood hobbies. I'm like, I'm busy, <laughs> you know. Yeah, what's good time for hobbies? Who's good time for hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't realize was that for certain activities that actually energized me, and I realized that these were creative activities, I started pottering and I started decorating my home, and I realized that doing those completely nothing to do with work, creative activities energized me. So I started weaving that when I started feeling healthy, I slept better because now the next thing that also happens when you're burnout, of course, you suffer of insomnia, right? When I got my sleeping patterns back, I started eating healthy. I started feeling better. I started drinking water. I started moving again. Then I started to feel energized again. Then I started looking at, um, you know, what am I doing the weekend to energize? Um, that those really, really, really supported me. And then, the other big one was boundaries. It's the healthy boundaries. And I think that's probably one of the biggest causes why people are struggling currently with burnout is because the, those healthy boundaries have been shifted because we're living in fear around losing our jobs. So, you know, it's a simple thing. What do you say yes to and what do you say no to? What do you need to delegate? 
mm. the effective planning around when can I do realistically, when can I do what? Um, I, for example, had to do something simple as saying, I say yes to one social engagement a week and I don't do more than one because in the week I work with people. Things like that. What does your healthy boundaries look like that can support you to become more effective and more efficient again? Yeah. And on that point, I just want to mention that, again, boundaries is so wonderfully connected to self-worth and yes. self-esteem yes. because we kind of have this and very often we find, especially in a coaching environment, we find that um, because people have this fear, this this wonderful false evidence appearing real situation where they're kind of going, oh, if I don't do this, if I don't do this now by six o'clock, I mean, it's already six o'clock and I've still got to get this in. Nice. Let me quickly just finish it. I'm, I've am i got the, my, my, my laptops open. You're kind of going, but where's, where's the boundary that you're going? Um, when can you just say, you know what? You know what? I'm not going to do this now. I will have it in your inbox by 8.30 tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. right? Where you can just say, actually, and it's just a mental conversation where you have to start framing, well, is this a boundary? Is someone overstepping my boundary? And fear usually plays into that a lot because you're kind of going, well, I haven't established the boundary, so that person doesn't really know the boundary. And I've also told that person that they can take advantage of my boundary anytime they want, right? People need to recognize that boundaries is, is not, it doesn't mean you're having a, 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 an argument with someone. It's just teaching people how to treat you. Yeah. Um, and a point on boundaries is leadership. Yeah. Uh, we discussed this around, you know, as a leader, if you're listening to this and you're a leader, know that you need to set up boundaries and you need to also be able to see your employee's boundary. And if they haven't established one, help them establish one. Because anything after a working hour is not okay, right? It's not okay. People are set up there for eight hours. They're already doing what they need to do. Um, rather work with them on time management so that they're efficient in the time that they're working than actively be uh, overstepping their, their boundaries. Because as the leader, you are responsible for your employers. You are responsible to them. And the more you have that frame around being responsible for setting up that that boundary with them, you're you're having a really good contract as how this is how you treat me, this is how I treat you. And if you don't set up that contract straight up in front, as leaders, you're not being you're not you're not leading. You know, I was very fortunate to, to work with some really extraordinary leaders leaders in, in my previous career. Um, and it is such a beautiful example of what you're talking to around leaders setting the boundaries. Um, you know, coming from a marketing agency environment, um, often it's a quite an abusive relationship between client and agency. Um, and then we had a leader that very fortunately look at the situation and goes, he does not accept us and he's setting healthy boundaries in place. And he started saying no to clients. Now we nearly <laughs> died. Like, what do you mean you can say no to the client? You can't say no to the client. They're going to fire us. Yes. But it was fascinating, you know, especially when it came to pitches. You know, you need to come pitch and you need to come do it in three days time. And then nobody in the entire agency sleeps for three days because we need yeah. to win the pitch, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he just put his foot down and said, if you want a decent pitch um, from us, I'm sorry, two weeks. If you want a crappy one, by all means, we can come present whatever we can whip together in three but, um, you know, um, actually, we respect you as our client. So if you respect us as an agency, you will allow us the two weeks. It forced our clients to plan better. And they started respecting us. And we got yeah. two weeks. And everybody in the agency, it, it shifted the way that we work with our client. It wasn't arrogant. It wasn't nasty. It wasn't about dumping them in the poo. It was creating healthy boundaries based on respect. Um, and it shifted. And because he, as a leader, stood up very firmly for his team, they said no more of yeah. this. No, you cannot ask four o'clock to have a budget on your table by eight o'clock the next morning. It's disrespectful towards your team. If you want a whip together budget, by all means. But if you want a profit budget that would take everything in consideration, you need to allow the team to, to have ad adequate time to complete it. So, yes, those boundaries and as leaders... 
and it comes to that self-worth, right? If, if we value ourselves, we put healthy boundaries in, in place for ourselves, and that's what we can do in our external world, world as well. And people start respecting that, right? Yeah, and yeah, I've used that. I've, I've done that by, by really subtly uh, setting the stage with people. And you just, in, in an email going, you know, for best business practice, um, this would this would take us at least three weeks. You know, you could just preface it in a nice. You don't have to say no. We're not going to do it. Yeah. You know, it's it's just in language and use the useful language to be able to do that. But so important to be able to set up a boundary that is useful for you and your client understands this is mm. this is my boundary, yeah. right? Um, so, Danny, So if we have to wrap this up for people and sort of go, okay, what are we? What are the key takeaways for you around this? What 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 is the key takeaway for today's conversation? So burnout is real, um, and we have to recognize it as leaders. We need to recognize it in ourselves and definitely look for it in our teams, um, and then support. We need to check around the belief systems. What is causing you to behave in this way? What is it that you need to challenge? How are you showing up? We yeah. have, as leaders, we have a responsibility to eyeball this, to get the help that we need, to do the things that we need to do to charge our batteries so that we can be energized again and efficiently show up as leaders in our business um, and setting that example for our teams. And then we need to put clear boundaries in place, um, you know, and, and celebrate our successes. It is just such an important thing when we are building new habits to celebrate, to allow the serotonin and release that that in the dopamine that, yeah. that uh, builds the habits. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing I want to share, guys, is love yourselves. And I've used this line before, but it's such a beautiful thing. Love yourselves enough to give yourself the best chance. Um. Because when you do that and when you really focus on everything we've spoken about today and really start paying attention to the signs and pay attention to how's your last three months looking, pay attention to that self-talk, pay attention to everything Leonie just mentioned, love yourself enough to give yourself the chance to actually take care of you. Because when you do that, you actively are involved with getting rid of burnout. And setting yourself up for success again, hey? Yeah. Mm. Yoni, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I love the conversation. I think oh. we <laughs> we covered some really interesting <laughs> points. Guys, next week uh, or next time, we're going to be speaking. Leone, I don't remember the actual theme now. Do you remember the theme? Oh, my gosh, Kevin. <laughs> Always again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Every time I go, oh, we chatted about it. No, I can't remember. Sorry. I, I think remember. we uh, we're speaking about self-deserving versus um, deserving, right? And Or not deserving, something like that. But, no, we're uh, going to lie. Let's keep it as, gonna a, as, a, as a big fat surprise. <laughs> big fat surprise, guys. So join us. It's going to be happening next uh, next month. And uh, obviously, you can catch us. Uh, you can check out uh, the websites. You can go to raintreecoaching.com and you can uh, email Leonie and team. You can also get hold of me at leadershipbydesign.co uh, and see what we do and how to get hold of us. Leonie, thank you so much for, for the chat today. And uh, I look forward to next month <laughs> loved it thank you kevin chat soon